viewers, and thank you for joining for Adventures of Commercialization. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Erica Lowe, a CEO and family office advisor, serial entrepreneur, investor, and, and an incredible mentor, not only for myself, but also for a <laughs> plethora of early stage startups. Hi, Erica. How are you today? Hi, Zoe. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yes, of course. Please tell us what you're up to these days. Well, after a long time at home, it felt like through COVID out here in Seattle, it's uh, I'm back on the road and it's nice to be nice to be out in the finance world again, looking at deals and getting in getting in the middle of the conferences and getting back going again. So, I'm working with a variety of companies and projects. I'm working with a early stage crypto company that's working on federating a stable coin inside the traditional banking system. So they're working, trying to work inside the system. So that's very exciting, trying to figure out how to bridge that gap between DeFi and institutional banking. So that's very interesting and leading to a lot of interesting conversations. So that's one project. Wow. Very cool. Well, when we first got to know each other, you were working for a capital fund. And so in past episodes, we've been speaking a little bit about individual investments and angel investments, but what exactly is a fund? How does that work? Uh, well, funds work in a little bit different ways, how, how they're set up, but generally a fund is essentially a bank uh, that is run by a private manager that collects investors from investment and and based on an investment set of criteria, they invest the money for those investors, whether it be into real estate uh, or into startups or healthcare companies can be into anything and structured in, in a, any sort of way loosely, but generally that's kind of the simplicity way of kind of having a look at it. Okay. And I know that you have uh, past experience with advising family offices. And so how does that structure and model work? Um, generally, when I work with family offices, it, you know, family offices is a business around their family money and legacy, right? So that, that means that they have some staff that looks at deal flow and advisors, but they're always doing business. It's a family office and it's creating a business of investment and investments around their family wealth. And that does that also means that just like entrepreneurs, which they oftentimes are, they need to go uh, meet, meet new people for strategic partnerships, for capital introductions, for a variety of reasons. So for the same reasons that an entrepreneur would want to come and work with someone like me to help market their business in front of these ultra high net worth um, investors, Many times family offices want to meet other family offices, so they're doing it oftentimes in the same way. Okay, great. And what are some of the pros and cons of, instead of rather doing an individual investment, going to say a fund or a family office for an entrepreneur? Uh, well, they're, they're two different things really, right? So if you're going to a fund, uh, for an entrepreneur, it's it's about fitting the checking the boxes, right? So it's very similar to just going directly to a, a family office or a straight investor. Uh, it just sort of depends how far along the company is and how far along and what size the fund is so that you can match those up, right? So early stage funds like tech funds, for example, are often oftentimes a bit smaller because they're doing smaller checks into earlier stage companies, where if you're doing a secondary or B and C rounds, you'll see the $100 million funds and up because they're writing $5 million checks uh, into later rounds of the companies. So that's kind of how you can think about that. And what would be the minimum criteria for, say, an early stage company that you would you would want to see? In to be in a fund or in a family office or? Well, great question. Um, let's say for a family office. Uh, many family offices invest very similar to the way angels invest. 
they just tend to have more staff to help them do it, right? So easily they can have a staff of, of analysts and lawyers and CPAs, you know, doing diligence and um, making sure that that company aligns with what they want to see as a family office for their investment criteria. But oftentimes, that alignment of investments is really key for family offices. So, you know, everybody knows that Warren Buffett's one of the greatest investors of all times. And one of the things that he really keeps um, in mind all the time is the alignment of his investments. And so I think that, that that's really important. If you have an investment over here and this company can help that investment grow, then, then you know, I, many family offices, you know, invest like that. So just getting in front of the right people. It's all timing. Uh, there's only a small amount of family offices that actually do really early stage investing. So, you know, you uh, you really want to make sure that you're ready to go out into that room. Uh, and when you do, you're, you're speaking with the right people. Okay. And what recommendations would you have for, say, a pitch deck or, say, like a term sheet? If, if somebody was to go like you mentioned, they should be ready. What, what kind of things would you consider ready? Uh, well, yeah, pitch deck, they should have had done, you know, <laughs> way early. So hopefully they um, have that pretty dialed in by the time they're uh, speaking with the family office. Family office is a very sophisticated investor. You know, they, you know, could easily, you know, have well over a, a hundred investments and thousands of deals in their lifetime again, have a staff of people looking at things. So yeah, I mean, you want you want to be prepared and ready and you, okay, so I'm, we, we're kind of putting them in the same buckets with the funds and family office, but uh, yeah. my <laughs> suggestion is, uh, yeah, have your ducks in a row, have your due diligence together, make sure everything is easy to see, keep your deck short and concise and have your pitch completely dialed in that, that you have other people talking about you. I mean, that's the key to try to get early stage investments, I think, in the family office space is to kind of go out like wildfire and get a bunch of people talking about you at once. And, and that is what gets uh, rounds filled fast and, and closed quickly. So to separate the two, so we have the family offices, which is just a group from family money where they are making educated uh, group decisions to invest in um, specific companies or group as in the family, correct? Uh -huh. And then with a fund, we're investing in a group of companies. And it's a, generally, it's, there's an investment screening committee and again, a, a little different type of analyst. And so it's a little bit, it's a slightly different, but as long as you're really, as same with the family office, it's easier to find out what the funds do, right? So you can look in Crunchbase, PitchBook, and you can find early stage tech funds and kind of doing that research if you're an early stage company and targeting those, if that's where you want to go next to get funding, that seems smart and efficient to me, right? I would, I would not really recommend an early stage company to go out into the family office space unless they're really unless they really have a reason to do that so if you're opening a luxury business of some kind a luxury travel company a luxury service business a, a business where marketing to the ultra high net worth client is going to make a difference in your business and your branding and your name recognition that would make a little more sense. But, but to be honest, you should probably be at B and C rounds a little later rounds before you're going into the family office space because they're not generally accustomed to writing checks under a million, under 5 million. And so they just don't want to deal with that many K-1s at the end of the year. Wow, great. Okay, that's, that's great insight. Thank you. Okay, well... Um... If we had say, I, so let's just say, I know for a fact that you are the guru of networking and that nobody have I ever met with as many business cards uh, collection as you do. So what are some of your tips and tricks for, for networking? You said you go to conferences. Is that, do you, do you have a minimum amount of conferences you need to hit a year? Do you have, go in with a game plan of who you're going to see and meet? How does this work? Yeah, well, it kind of depends where you are in it, in the timing of your raise and uh, your marketing of your company and what you want to do. And honestly, this is where 
sometimes you know paying a consultant can make sense because it accelerates your time frame you know if you're trying to raise you know 10 or 20 million dollars and you can have a consultant take you through uh the family office uh space and do introductions for you for six to nine months you should have enough you know leads a lot enough marketing enough name recognition that you should be able to be doing a lot of follow-up uh, as a ceo and and hopefully putting your business uh, forward um, but unless you're ready to really kind of commit to that kind of time frame and do that um, you're gonna spend two three years maybe running out of money going through the family office space it's very hard to stand out in the room it's a little bit easier post covid because the conferences are smaller i will say that but um as we were talking about earlier zoe the the room is full of men most of the entrepreneurs that coming that are coming through are men and it is a little bit hard to stand out in the room and to be honest i mean you have to work on that you wear a hat do you wear an orange tie do you have a cool shirt you can wear i mean anything that you can do to kind of stand out a little bit honestly make funky pair of socks like I you know whatever it is that that you feel comfortable doing and then you have to be outgoing I mean you really have to be able to walk up to a total stranger and start conversation and if you are uncomfortable doing that then that's something you need to really practice and work on join at Toastmasters or uh, join you know start in your local area where you can just practice and that's the best way to do it so they've said a lot of CEOs, especially of tech companies or like these introverts that just may not be the best person to stand up in front of the crowd and be that outgoing individual that you're, you're saying is going to stand out. Do you think that it is valuable for a company to bring in somebody who is that spunky, oh, yeah. outgoing person? Or do you think it looks bad for the CEO not to be representing his own uh, Company. Well, depending upon the stage of the company, most investors want to look the CEO right in the face and in the eye, right? Early stage company investments are very risky. And no matter what their platform or profile or product or idea is, it's you're investing in the CEO, you're investing in the team and the jockey, you know, can he get it past the finish line? And nobody really knows that. And so it, you're taking a bit of a gamble. And so there's no way that the CEO can up, get away from it or avoid the conversation, but certainly they can have a consultant, a chief marketing person, uh, another very top tier co-founder that can go out and start the process or help the process. But ultimately that CEO will need to speak to the investors and, mm -hmm. and um, the, the investors will make the decision based on that meeting ultimately. So I think when you're dealing with a CEO like that is try to keep them comfortable in the space that they're comfortable. So if it's a brainy scientist, put them on the brainy scientist panel and let them shine in what they do, right? So spotlight their talent and, and focus on that and you know have a marketing person or a consultant bringing introductions. But if, if you focus on that and get them at the right events, then they'll have a line of people waiting to talk to them just because it's what they do well, right? And then people also do want to invest in that. You don't have to be a social butterfly to get investment. You just have to be, you know, super smart and have a compelling story. But everybody does like to spend money when they're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true too. <laughs> uh, okay, well, as you mentioned, and as we spoke about um, prior to this call, we it is a male-dominated industry, and you have led a very successful career, and um, I just wonder what kind of hurdles have you faced as a woman on the industry, and how did you overcome them? I mean, you know, I'm a woman, so we deal with hurdles professionally all the time, every day. <laughs> I mean, not every day, but a lot throughout our careers. And that's part of being a woman. And I think, you know, I've also had some advantages, I think, being a woman too, right? Uh, not, not being afraid to ask for referrals and assistance and information, you know, particularly when I was young and starting out, um, you know, I think it's important. And I think other women helped me a lot of ways. 
Um, I think there is this kind of oftentimes this underlying band of women where we really will stick together and really will help each other out, particularly when you get kind of, you know, past the early 20s, uh, because we're all in it together. So um, it makes a big difference. I think having a good tribe professionally of women that uh, can help mentor you, help when you're stuck, answer questions, give referrals. You know, I think it's great. I mean, there's all kinds of things you deal with, with um, male investors, particularly if you're a female entrepreneur and you're out on investor meetings that sometimes can get very fuzzy what the meeting is for. And so you do have to be, you know, very careful and, and uh, you know, keep friendly, friendly and professional. <laughs> so it's a challenge, um, but you just persevere. And if you have a great big tree in your way, trying to knock you down, you just go around it and you just keep going. That's the way I've always done it. Or you chop the tree down. I mean, there's only two choices. <laughs> <laughs> I see you chopping it down, powering through it as you are. Um, so if I know that you have invested in over 33 companies yourself, and you mentioned you were a serial entrepreneur of several of those companies. And can you tell me a little bit about your experience of being, what, how, do you go about your serial entrepreneurship? What companies have you looked at and do you align with personally? Well, uh, so, so some of those companies when I were, was when I was quite young. A lot of the early stage kind of tech companies, we had an apparel company, a radio station, travel company. <laughs> a lot of those we really... Uh, all right. I was co-founder. I was first money in. I was had a board seat. Uh, some of those companies were straight real estate, um, individual builds or investments uh, that I was also a big part of, big part of the build, project manage, watch it. You know, I'm an Aries, I think. So I'm a constant learner. And so having different types of businesses and different types of structures is just this constant part of my learning process. In, in life, I guess. <laughs> and so I, I'm always interested. That's why I'm in crypto now. I mean, I'm not fully in crypto, but I mean, it's, I'm certainly going to salt in crypto Bahamas at the end of April. And uh, I love being on that kind of bleeding cutting edge of just continually learning about new industries. There's a certain amount of business that is the same you know, you set, got to set up a structure and you got to have documents and you got to have marketing. And, you know, there's a certain amount of no matter what the business is, the structure will be very similar. But trying to at least learn and stand next to really smart people that are talking about stuff <laughs> and, and write and try to continue moving forward with my own education and my own career, I think is really valuable for, for any entrepreneur. Yeah, as it sounds like you didn't stay within the same industry for very long, that you kind of, when you finished one, you moved to the furthest end of the other side of the spectrum so you could learn something different. <laughs> Actually, many of the businesses happened at the same, you know, at the same time, okay. to be honest with you. So like the travel company I had for like 10 years and the radio station we had for a fair amount of years until we exited to Disney. And, you know, some of them failed and went into the garbage, you know, I mean, and some of the investments disappeared before, you know, I could blink. And so I had everything happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds successful. What is, so some companies, when, when did you feel it was the right time to exit? Because that's something that, you know, some people will hold on to a company because it's their baby forever. Whereas when I worked in the industry, a lot of these companies are like serial entrepreneurs, people who come in, they get on a board of a company or, or become an interim CEO. And then next thing you know, they're like just trying to take it to exit. But what, what do you see as a successful turn for that? Well, I mean, each, each of each experience I had was slightly different. So um, when we exited to, you know, we had the radio station company that I really wasn't running day to day, but that was a, a fairly decent exit, not giant, but respectable. And it was time, it was other investors were in the company. And I think whenever you have investors to answer to, you, you have to really be cognizant of that exit. And so you have to be careful as an entrepreneur not to attach it as your baby. And remember that 
um, it is a business and there is a time to let it go. And that you, if you take investor money, you're going to have a responsibility to return to them. Um, so, I mean, that's the reality of it that a lot of entrepreneurs forget. For many of the companies that I really started or was really a part of, fortunately, I didn't take investor money. And so the exit of those companies got to depend on on my own personal experience of what I was happening in my life, you know, as I was having children, you know, for progressing through my life, I was able to move through my own personal businesses in the, in the manner which worked for my life, thankfully. <laughs> when some companies would come to pitch to you, what are, I know that some green lights are potentially a board or a good consultant and network. Are there any other things that would really catch your eye that you're looking for in companies that? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think a, a great story, a great product, like what are you doing and how cool is it? Like, is it cool? Is it cutting edge? Is it fairly unique? Is there a niche in the, in the industry that it would fill? Um, so that it has a great chance of success. And then who's running it? Like, what do, how do I feel about that CEO? How do I, how do I feel about that, the way that person is growing the business, how they manage the business and what their path is for, you know, exiting the business and, and having a success with it. And are there any things that would be a giant red flag for you? Like... Uh, lack of transparency and lack of communication. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and if, the, if the diligence room isn't like super clear, all the legal docs need to be in there. Um, and, and just most things are, are not very secret. And entrepreneurs really like to just, oh, my work, my work, my work. And I think that they can get in their own way doing that. Um, I mean, if it's, it'll either be IP or patent protected. Uh, if it if that's the required space, and if it's not, then some other business has already done this, and maybe ten others have, and so then it's just a matter of can you run the business in a way that it can be successful, right? So mm -hmm. get the information out there and make it clean and concise, and so that's key. Yes, and so these companies, I mean, they we do a lot of NDAs. I've seen companies come through and have everybody in the room sign an NDA. Would that be a red flag for you that they're not quite at the stage and willing to give out the information, or maybe they have a little bit more work to do, or they're just top secret and you need to know about it right now? I mean, again, yeah, unless you're trying to do like some top, top secret government report that is really something that no one else could possibly have it's probably not necessary and a bit of overkill. And if you are making people sign an NDA, you better make it super easy for them, right? You docu sign it, the document populates right after it. You better be immediately on that. If you're expecting people to sign things or even use their own Adobe to get things back to you, you're probably not gonna get it back or you're gonna miss some opportunity. And I see that all the time. I see entrepreneurs, I see especially female entrepreneurs, honestly, get, just get in their own way with stuff like that. So, you know, getting out of your own way is, is part of it. Wonderful. Well, all this has been fantastic. And thank you so much for coming on our show. If we had one last piece of advice that you could give to entrepreneurs, what would that be? You know, follow your passion and uh, listen to all the good advice and let the rest fall to the ground. Awesome. Well, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Erica, for coming on Adventures of Commercialization. It's always a pleasure to see you and speak with you and potentially reach out to you with more mentor, <laughs> mentor advice for us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Zoe, and best of luck with this. Thanks. Have a great evening. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii.
If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.